I don't think it was ever one moment, but it was a continual building process to say, I want to be a liaison, a mediator for those who don't know how to navigate this health field, this health uh, world. I want to be that advocate for those individuals. And that is why I chose the health education track um, for my MPH, because I wanted to to say, okay, we have individuals who are experiencing, and of course, as I said, I started getting involved in diabetes education. We have individuals who are utilizing the system, but for various reasons may not fully understand or are or, or may not be able to maximize um, the healthcare system. And I want to be that person in my work. Welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm your host, Omari Richards, founder of the Public Health Millennial. We're going to dive deep into public health topics and career journeys. You'll hear diverse career stories, absorb professional development and career strategies, get tips while also learning from others to help you in your own journey and learning of public health. Learn about the vast world of public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories. Stay tuned so we can do our part towards a culture of health, well-being, and equity for all. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Public Health Careers. In today's episode, you'll hear more about why and how this person chose to pursue an MPH after seven years of being a pharmacy technician, how you can gain local perspective and insights in public health when you're doing an online MPH program, how she built expertise to the point where people were asking for her support, which then turned into more consulting work and how you can do the same in your career path, and then choosing to become a volunteer grant writer to build on a skill set she wanted to gain more competency around. If you enjoyed today's content, all I ask is that you hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and share it with someone who gets some value from it. This is truly the best way to support the show and help us to get out to more people and help other people navigate, learn, and transform their public health careers. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share it with someone. Okay, enjoy the show. Hi, this is Sarah Grant. I'm a health educator and consultant, and you're listening to Public Health Careers. Today, we have an experienced public health professional and contractor. She has conferred a Bachelor's of Science in Biomedical Sciences at Oakwood University and her Master of Public Health at Northern Illinois University. She currently works as a consultant program manager at Unstuck. We have Sarah Grant, MPH, Ches, CDCES. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Truly, truly is my pleasure. Um, I'm glad that we we're able to connect and I'm looking forward to hearing more about your story and how, how you got into where you are today. Definitely. Yeah. So before we hop into anything, how do you identify and tell us a little bit about your personal background? Okay. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am of Caribbean parents, uh, but I've been in the U.S. <laughs> been in the U.S. most of my life, and been in the southeast uh, of the U.S. most of my life as well. Um, raised in Florida, went to school in Alabama, lived in Georgia for many years. So, the, and and now have made my way back to Florida. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about my personal uh, background. Um, outside of public health, I, I'm into music and, and just, you know, enjoying the outdoors. So a little bit about me outside of my work. And when you say you, you enjoy music, is that playing music or listening to music or both? Both, but I enjoy playing music. And, and what kind of music do you play? I play the flute and the piano, um, not as much as I would like, but, but yeah, mostly um, those two. Okay, well, love, love, love to hear it, love to hear it. And I uh, definitely also have a thing for the Southeast USA. I think it is a, a place that, that has, that means a lot to a lot of Black people in, in the US. And I think it, it has a lot of opportunities for growth. And um, I, I enjoy being in the Southeast as well. So, so shout out to the Southeast USA. So talk more about top tips for getting contracting roles that you are qualified for, being a consultant. So it's so interesting that you ask that question because um, the consulting part of my journey is, is something that I am actually still growing in, still um, developing. Um, but I'll tell um, um, your audience what I am currently uh, working on as far as becoming a consultant. Being a consultant is something that, um, and, and others may identify with this, um, you were a consultant before you knew you were a consultant. Right. Because people 
ask you for your your advice. People ask you for your expertise. And then the more that you progress in it, you realize, oh, this is something that uh, I can monetize, that I can actually um, do on a on an official basis. So this is this is kind of the the route that it has been for me. Um, but definitely um, pursuing people. Um, online who are doing the things that I am interested in doing and pursuing has been my number one thing. So the the people that I follow on social media, the people whose LinkedIn's that I follow, I look at individuals who have my uh, particular degree pathways and then say, okay, what well, what kind of job opportunities or what kind of um, ways have they used um, their degrees for their consulting? And that has been, um, you know, one of the, the most helpful ways. And then of course, using my own network um, has been very helpful to say, okay, these individuals in my, my, my circles are in need of my skills. How can I be of assistance to them? So those are two of the, the main things that I'm working on right now. And that that's a good point around, you are oftentimes a consultant unofficially before officially becoming a consultant. And I think that kind of plays into the importance of people that do consulting work is that they are just good at something and people are always asking them for questions and they're like, oh, as you said, like, how can you monetize that? So when when thinking about that train of thought, what was the the thing that people were asking you for support or help around? Uh, mainly about diabetes, because that's what I have um, been um, involved in for the past few years. So asking for advice about, you know, a loved one that they have with diabetes or um, needing, you know, advice or recommendations regarding uh, their diabetes management. So that's where, um, where most of that developed for me. Um, but then of course, making sure that I'm not limiting myself and saying, hey, you know what, some of the same issues that people are facing regarding diabetes apply to other areas of chronic disease and then public health as a whole. And your journey in public health, as we'll get into in a bit, uh, encompasses a wide range of roles. How do your experiences as a certified health education specialist and a certified diabetes educator influence your approach to chronic disease prevention and health education? Yeah, so, you know, it, it's so interesting how um, these various experiences have compounded uh, because I'm able to use my expertise as far as uh, educating on a more formal uh, level and then also being able to, to do the one on one. So I've been able to use that experience uh, with my CHES certification to inform how I am able to deliver, how I'm able to tailor materials and programs based on the person, based on the educational level or their level of health literacy um, to address their particular needs. Um, and then of course with the CDC, yes, which is the, the certification for diabetes care and education specialist, I'm able to, to then just build upon that general health education, but also integrate some more of the clinical side of, of Medicare, um, excuse me, of, of, of medication management and, um, and diabetes management. I like the thought process that you shared there around like compounding experiences and just how like building off of that health education background and then getting into diabetes, diabetes prevention. And then that being the thing that people just continually ask you questions about, which kind of built up your expertise in this field. So that, that's awesome. And before we get into like your actual journey of getting to where you are today, what does public health mean to you? So for me, public health is about whole health. I, I love that the definition even of public health has been redefined and redefined over the years uh, so that it's not just about physical health or it's not just about infectious disease, but there are so many areas of our lives that are touched by public health or that public health practitioners uh, influence. Um, and so um, I always think about whole health when I think about public health. And I also think about prevention um, while the, there's so much value in the healthcare system as it is now and um, in, in clinical um, disease management, there is a, a value in prevention that the U.S. as a whole could benefit from much more. And, uh, and, and I'm glad to be a part of that. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you can leave it there because I feel like there's a lot that could be said around that. <laughs> and, and on this podcast, we, we definitely realize the, the importance and just how beneficial it is to have prevention as a key 
in the cases that you're looking at and just really focusing on that. And that that is the beauty of public health. It is that we are thinking about how do we prevent things from actually happening before they happen? And what does that look like in all aspects of like that whole health as you were just talking about, which I think is, is a really good way to think about it. So, so I appreciate you sharing that. And now getting more into your, your collegiate career. So you got your Bachelor's of Science in Biomedical Sciences at Oakwood University. Tell us about that thought process of going into undergrad. Yeah, so I have been interested in pharmacy for a long time. And I know you're like, pharmacy? We're talking about public health. Um, I was interested in pharmacy. And as one of the pre-pharmacy tracks, I pursued biochemistry as my undergrad. Um, and then after the first couple of years, um, the biomedical science degree became available. And in looking at the course list, um, it, it was clear to me that that would be more beneficial for me as far as getting more of that clinical or that human um, health uh, experience. And so I changed to biomedical sciences. Yeah. Um, what was the thought process of thinking about wanting to become like a pharmacist? Where, where did that, that come from? Yes, yeah, interesting. Um, I, I really enjoyed science um, as a as a middle school, high schooler, um, and so back in the day, uh, long ago, before um, online searches were a thing, um, we used to look through the the actual books, the career books that that talked about different uh, health. I mean, excuse me, different careers, and so looking at different science careers and being able to shadow um, in retail pharmacy as a high school student, I got interested in pursuing pharmacy. Um, but of course, the 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 journey took me a different way. But that was the origin of that. And that's the beauty of a journey in public health, I think, is like really just knowing that you have this direction of focusing on health and that could come from different aspects. Many times it's a clinical aspect of health. And then from that, we learn, oh, just getting exposed to public health and that prevention aspect of things, which I think is important. So uh, that's cool. So you, during your undergrad, you were a pharmacy tech at CVS Pharmacy. So I guess that's also aligned with this idea of becoming a pharmacist. So tell us about that experience. Yeah, so I um, started that role in my senior year and ended up being a pharmacy technician for about seven years. And so I gained a lot of experience, leadership experience as well, um, learned a lot about quality, um, quality improvement measures, which is so um, important in pharmacy and many other fields. And so, um, of course, I can look back at it now and realize that a lot of those skills um, have been beneficial to me. Um, as far as identifying and improving upon quality and, and being able to, to train others um, and practice some of those skills as well. We hear about quality improvement or QI a lot in public health, in health care, in, in those like de uh, intersections of those fields. What, what does that tangibly mean for the work that you are doing as a pharmacy tech? So uh, at least in retail, pharmacy and probably in other areas as well, there, the demand is always increasing. The demand to produce more, to churn out more prescriptions, to see more clients in a day, in a shift is always increasing. And it's just at a point you realize it's not humanly possible to just keep doing more. Are you going to just work longer hours? I mean, what, how are you going to achieve that? But you have to work smarter. You have to improve the quality. You have to improve the systems that you're using. You have to better train the workforce um, so that you're not just trying to work harder and harder to do more, but actually, you know, using the resources that you have at your disposal to, to make things more efficient and, of course, um, better for the clients you're serving overall. Makes sense. And I think that just understanding the leverage points that they are in systems or in the work that we do, to, to your point, not try to create more work, but find ways to make that work more efficient, which, which is very, very important. And then did you have any undergrad takeaways that, that you wanted to share with us? My biggest undergrad takeaway is take advantage of the opportunities that you have for shadowing, for internships, um, and then also recognize that you, you don't want to lock yourself into any one particular field. You, you want to be focused. You want to have a plan for sure. But recognize that 
what you start with as a freshman may not be what you finish with as a senior or as you matriculate to to graduate studies uh, because you get the exposure and you start figuring out what you actually are interested in and have the capability of doing. You might say, you know, and I've had several colleagues who started off in biology and realized I don't want to handle needles. I don't want to do, I don't want to go to med school. I don't want to do this. I, you know, you recognize what your capacity is. And so be willing to uh, be, uh, to make those changes. And I'll also add one little plug here um, at my school at the time, of course, this is who um, looking at 20 years ago um, when I started, they were very much of the of the uh, mindset that if you're in biology or in biomedical sciences, you're pre-med. And the pathways were much more limited at that time. But my my encouragement to people uh, in the undergrad uh, uh, journey right now, don't be limited. The, the field of healthcare and science and medicine is big and broad, and we need all of those allied professionals alongside of our um, medical doctors. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I think like just being willing to change the idea of what you thought your life or the job that you're going to be is very, very important. Because as you said, the exposure is, is just so fundamental and getting that experience. And like to your to your point in your story, it was being, well, doing some work while you were, I think you said in high school, that kind of got you interested in into pharmacy work. And then from there, you're like, okay, I'm doing this pharmacy tech stuff. And we'll hear a little bit more about how that pivot happened into thinking about a master's of public health. But it's just important to to know that this world has so many opportunities and many times we don't know what the opportunities are out there so just be willing to be open to those opportunities and to change in your mind along along the path but just have a direction i think is is what's most important in all the things that you do as a, as a public health professional you continued on in your pharmacy technician job at tvs for seven years so maybe tell us a little bit about what you learned throughout that process and then you also got your master's of public health at Northern Illinois University CU. So tell us more about the work that you did as a pharmacy tech. And then what what was that thing that was like, oh, yes, I want to get my master's of public health. How did that come up for you? So uh, interesting story that um, wouldn't really show up looking at my um, LinkedIn is that I actually did go to pharmacy school for three years. Um, however, um, I would say a combination of, of immaturity and, and um, not pursuing the, the resources that I had um, at my disposal. You know, I wasn't as successful as I should have been in, in matriculating through that program. Um, and so um, to answer your second question, um, I actually took a summer program. I participated in a summer program in my junior year of college um, that was at uh, Yale School of Public Health. And even though it was really more of a, a, a medical-based kind of study, it was based at the School of Public Health. And that was really my first exposure to public health. I, I did not know about public health. I hadn't thought about doing public health as, as, a, as a profession. I was pharmacy uh, uh, all the way. Um, and so at, during that time, this in 20, 2006, I started thinking even about doing pharmacoepidemiology because, you know, of course, pharmacy was uh, something I really enjoyed, really, really loved. Um, I thought about, wow, you know, when we think about on the population level, how many people suffer from the adverse effects that may come from their pharmaceutical uh, therapies, how, I mean, pharm pharmacological therapies, how many people may suffer from lack of understanding or lack of awareness. So what kind of um, impact could I make as a pharmacist being able to take that understanding from the public health realm? And so that's really where things started to merge for me. And so, of course, um, like I said, you know, was going the pharmacy track for um, some time there. And um, then, you know, once once kind of that door closed for me, I started looking again at public health. I said, you know what, I thought about this several years ago. How can I pick this up again? And of course, 
you know, I carried those experiences with me because that's also where I first started getting interested in diabetes education and wanting to be a diabetes educator. So all of these things were just little, little thoughts in the back of my mind, little experiences that at the time I did not see how they were all interconnected. But now, you know, several years later, I'm seeing that all of these things were were building um, in me. So, you know, of course, um, started the process of applying for um, my public health master's in 2013. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, started learning more about what opportunities were available to me there. So hopefully that that kind of gives you a, a broader picture. So of course, during that time, I continued working as a pharmacy technician because that is the, the field that I was pursuing at that time. Okay, well, thank you for being vulnerable there and sharing that. Uh, I appreciate that a lot. So was it that you were a pharmacy tech while you were in pharmacy school? Yes. Okay. And I, I really like the point of you highlighting that this course that you took uh, at Yale sometime in undergrad was fundamental in, in like just exposing you to public health and, and what it what it is, because I think many times when we are in those clinical types of degrees, more, I guess less so now, but um, in, in the past, it's like they don't talk about public health. You don't understand like that as a concept, that as a field, this is a way that people work and think. Um, so I think that that's important and it kind of maybe planted that seed for you to to take all that the thought process on that framework of public health and really think about like this pharmacy school thing that I'm doing right now, there's more that I can do or like there are populations that I can do work with or like maybe there was there was a, a, a case of you just wanting to do more health education type stuff. Um, so so I, I really, really appreciate you sharing that. So before we talk more about the, I guess the direct thought process of applying to the MPH program, how how did you personally get over like the feeling of quote unquote failure of of like not completing the pharmacy school route? That is a good question. It was definitely a long process, and you know, just wanting to make sure that I um, I pivot and that I remain flexible and that I take advantage of the opportunities that I did have, um, and especially with being able to pursue um, the, the online um, public health degree. And so, you know, it, it was a lot of self-reflection, a lot of saying, okay, what were some of the issues that I had at that point? And how can I ensure that I don't reproduce that as I move forward in whatever I choose to study after that? So you got your master's of public health at Northern Illinois University. Tell us more about that thought process of of wanting to do the master's of public health. You shared a little bit about about it, like vaguely, but was there like that one moment that you're like, okay, this is this is like what I want to do. Like I want to dig di dive deeper into this, and like, what was that moment for you? Yes, I, I I don't think it was ever one moment, but it was a continual building process to say, I want to be a liaison, a mediator for those who don't know how to navigate this health field, this health uh, world. I want to be that advocate for those individuals. And that is why I chose the health education track um, for my MPH, because I wanted to, to say, okay, we have individuals who are experiencing, and of course, as I said, I started getting involved in diabetes education. We have individuals who are utilizing the system, but for various reasons may not fully understand or are, are or may not be able to maximize um, the healthcare system. And I want to be that person in my work. Okay. And during your MPH, you were a health promotion intern at Ulcris Medical Center. Tell us about that experience. Yes, it was a really great experience. And it was also my first exposure working for a federally qualified health center. Um, so Oakhurst, which is now called Medicare, is, is an FQHC. And um, I was able to, again, do diabetes education. So that was really my first time being able to facilitate classes and, uh, and really prepare materials and practice my delivery and all of that. Um, 
and then also work on some of the other quality things that they needed help with as far as developing some of their other service lines. So um, it was a really good opportunity for me to see what community engagement was like, um, what it was like working with different populations of people at that particular facility. They serve um, a lot of immigrants, a lot of individuals who speak different languages, who uh, may be low income, underinsured and things like that. So it gave me um, a really good exposure that opportunity. Yeah, and just take notes because I think they have F FQHCs all, all over the US where people can find internships and find opportunities to work. And I think like the, the benefit of that is that, as you say, you, you get exposed to a lot of different things that are going on at the FQHCs, F FQHCs, yes, mm -hmm. so, so that, you, so that you're, you're building out like a broader skill set as you're coming out of your, your public health program, which I think is, is very important as well. How did the diabetes prevention part come up? Was that was that just that the work that you got assigned was focused on diabetes, or was there some inherent interest that you had in in that? I was interested in it already. Um, interestingly, on a personal note, um, I have a family history of diabetes. I had a grandmother who passed in twenty eleven um, due to in part with complications of diabetes, and so. At that time, um, of course, being in the pharmacy world, I thought to myself, I want to know everything that I can so that in the future, I can be more of assistance, more of an advocate and a voice for my family members or other loved ones. Um, and then, of course, on the larger scale, who who may not have ready access, the same level of health care that I might have, but still may need to know this information. So that was kind of um, one of the, the more personal motivating factors for me. Um, and so thankfully, as I developed the internship with the CEO of that FQHC, I was able to propose that as one of my um, areas of work to say, you know, right now they have a vacancy, they didn't have a diabetes educator. And I said, I am welcome, of course, under the supervision of their medical director and, and nursing staff. Um, but I am more than happy to pick that up and, and revitalize that and put some things in place. And that that's awesome to hear that you came to the internship with ideas of things that, that you want to work on or like topics that you were interested in. Because I think that initiative is something that employers, preceptors, in like they like that. They like to see students taking initiative and saying, hey, this is what I would like to do. And like, it doesn't always work out the way that, that you'd like to do it. But at the end of the day, you have to ask for what you want or, or you'll, ne you'll never get it. So, so shout out to you for doing that. And before we, we move on to after your MPH um, degree, were there any big takeaways from your MPH that you wanted to share? Yes. So as I mentioned briefly earlier, I did my degree online. I was living in Georgia at the time, but I did my degree online with Northern Illinois University. And while as a as a working person, um, being able to do an online degree was very advantageous, I definitely saw the advantages of having a of completing a degree in a local um, location where you live. <clears throat> Reason being because you're able to network more easily, you're able to uh, look for jobs more easily in your local network when you attend the school where you live. So that was just something that that um, I wish that I had more opportunities for because, of course, my school did have um, an online job platform and posting kind of site, but everything was for Illinois. Um, so, um, you know, of course, you know, I did take the initiative to look at the local schools around me and, and say, OK, if they're having a presentation or they're having some sort of a panel or a discussion or something. I did my best to try to go and attend just for that local context. Um, but that's one thing that, you know, I definitely would have would have wished for more. And then the second thing I would say to uh, those going through the grad school process right now is take advantage of your access to your professors and to the platforms that you have access to as a student now, um, such as your, you know, your SAS or your journal, um, journal search platforms and databases, because of course, many of those, once you graduate, you have to pay for, so take advantage of them while you have access. Yeah, we could talk about in inequities in that all, all day long, but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> because that, that's, that's interesting in itself, but but uh, that 
Thank you for sharing that insight about like the online versus the the in person, and I think that that's something that people can think about. But what I think, what what I like that you highlighted that I haven't heard other people highlight before is that even though you were online and you weren't con- connected directly to the school community, you s- seeked out opportunities for other public health schools that are close to you and and seeing what they have there as well because that is always something that that is an option and i feel like many times we don't even think about that as an option and um so that that's a great way to continue to like maybe build your network learn some new stuff get connected to another school um so that i I appreciate you sharing that because i don't think anyone has mentioned that before so appreciate that no problem yeah, and and if you are, I don't know if it's going to be released by the time this episode is released, but be on the lookout because the Public Health Millennial is going to be creating an online community for those people that that maybe do feel like they need a little bit more community. Granted, it's still going to be online, maybe meetups in the future, but uh, just be on the lookout for that. Great. Okay, so you graduated from your MPH degree and you became a patient educator, vaccine coordinator, navigator, pharmacy tech at Four Corners. Plus, is that four corners plus? So, t- tell, us, yeah. so t- tell us about that job. And it seemed like there were a lot of intersecting roles and responsibilities in that one job that you did there. So t- talk to us more about that. Yeah, so I was at Four Corners Primary Care Centers, which is another FQHC um, in, in the Atlanta area for about six years, I believe. And um, during that time, my role also progressed. So uh, because at the time I was a pharmacy technician finishing my MPH degree, um, they had an interest in developing an in-house dispensary for their clients where they were able to look to offer low cost or free medications to their uh, clients. Of course, as an FQHC, the majority of their population, their target population is also low income, uninsured or underinsured. And so I came on in that role and and then also as a referral coordinator. And and my role just continued to grow, especially once I graduated and once I really um, demonstrated my interest in health education and and diabetes education. Um, I also took advantage of the the gap that they had there. They didn't have a a health education program or, or consistent service. So I was able to really have free reign to, to develop my schedule, develop my topics, you know, get interest from the staff, get interest from the patients on what they were interested in, and really develop that um, program over the, the next few years. That's amazing. And tangibly, how did you demonstrate interest for doing this type of work to the organization? Well, you know, as time went along, of course, just just demonstrating my my good work ethic and 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 knowledge base and things like that, I I ended up being a part of the executive board, and so I was able to have more of a contribution into the the programs and services that were being offered there. So uh, that's how I was able to, to demonstrate that interest. Yeah, you. I I think it always starts with being a good employee or being just someone who does does the work, you know, mm-hmm. and and showing up as best as possible, yes. which I think a lot of people overlook. And I will add that, um, of course, as a as a new grad, we're always looking to improve our negotiation skills and saying, okay, if I if I would like to negotiate for this higher salary, what other skills and services can I bring to the table? Um, and so that was some of those conversations that I was having to say, hey, I've now graduated with my master's degree. And of course, granted, working at an FQHC, you will not expect to receive the same kind of salary as those who may work in the private sector. Um, but but definitely being able to have that conversation and, and, and present some of those or propose some of those other services. Yeah, yeah, and definitely trade offs in wanting to work in in a certain place, and um, so I, I think that's also something that people have to take into consideration when they are thinking about careers after graduating, whether that's from your bachelor's or your master's. Like, what is the the potential? And I know like salary is just one of the things there. There's like work life balance. There's a bunch of other things that kind of uh, are important to a holistic good job profile um that, that people should think about and maybe i'll create a post not maybe i will create a post more about those different things that you could think about so that you'll have that information because i think that's important definitely because of course that fqhc 
functioned on an eight to five kind of a schedule, which is great for um, a lot of individuals who may have family obligations or just looking for a more consistent kind of a work schedule. And so as time went along, I progressed to, you know, as the opportunity or the need arose to become trained as a life, I mean, excuse me, a navigator for the health insurance marketplace. So of course, Obamacare, um, that that was the, the act that was passed um, about that time in 20, uh, 2010. Um, and so got trained for that. And then, of course, later on, there was a need for, again, quality improvement regarding the immunization program. And so I was able to reach back to a lot of my pharmacy training, actually, to help me um, be able to really engage with the medical assistants and the providers from a clinical point of view, but also say, okay, recognizing the, the needs that you have, how can we also improve quality, uh, uh, reduce errors, and things like that. So it was a, a gradual process for me, but really just pivoting to meet the needs of the organization while using the skills that I had developed in, in other roles. I think to that point, there is there are no failures because, as you're saying, you you use that experience from pharmacy school to to really inform how you approach this work and made it more successful because you knew the intersections of those different rules of public health and pharmacy. So um, I, I think like just to highlight once again, like even though quote unquote, there are these failures in our, in our lives, there's still learning lessons and ways for us to build off of them. Um, and just like seeing that it is an opportunity is, is important. So, so uh, I appreciate you sharing that too. And then you became a health education and resource development officer for chronic disease at Black Beetle Health. And you did this as a freelance position. So how do you come across this? And then what did you do in it? Yeah, so um, actually, um, my brother is, was the CEO of this charity. Um, and he invited me to come on as a volunteer. Of course, being that I had the chronic disease or health education background, um, he definitely wanted that as one of the pillars of the organization. Um, the organization, the charity is um, a, an education platform, a health equity uh, resource platform, particularly focused on um, individuals in the LGBT and Black and people of color communities in the UK. Um, and so I was able to um, engage in and helping with researching and developing print and online um, health education resources. Um, and it started around 2020. So it was actually an a, amazing time to, to pivot into the use of online platforms, um, Instagram, uh, live feeds and all of that. So it was just, a, you know, of course, a really a good time to be able to explore other methods of communicating with um, the community and clients. So was much of that role focused around providing health education information on social media platforms or were there other um, responsibilities in that role as well? That was uh, the primary, but then it transitioned into uh, developing um, uh, resource guides that could be given in print um, as well and, and placed in various um, uh areas around um, select uh, parts of the UK or, you know, mainly uh, the big cities like London. Uh, but I was able to work on resource guides around breast cancer, of course, diabetes, hypertension, sickle cell. Um, and then, of course, talking about the relationship with COVID, because that's what was, um, of course, on everyone's mind at, at that time in 2020. So it was a good opportunity to to not get so restricted in diabetes, but also think about how some of those um, same issues carry across other chronic disease uh, conditions. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And um, it's dope that uh, your brother started this organization and then you have a skill set that is aligned with it and able to complement and support the work that he started, uh, which I think is always awesome. Uh, so shout out to the Power family. Mm hmm <laughs> using and your I, networks, I, using your networks, and I'll reiterate that yeah. later. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, great example of that for sure. <laughs> you never know. Even if it's not your brother, you might have a cousin, aunt, uncle, someone out there that, that could connect you or support you or get you into a role. Uh, so definitely, definitely think about that and reflect on who is in your network and how can you uh, utilize that to take that next step in your career. Mm -hmm. And you shifted 
in Black Beetle Health to a contracted project manager for chronic disease management. So what was that shift like? Did the responsibilities change or was it just that you had a bigger workload of the same responsibilities? It was a bigger workload of those same responsibilities. It went to, uh, because of the, the, the great work that that we were able to demonstrate across the, the whole organization. You know, we were getting opportunities for more bids, more funding and things like that. And so it allowed the position to, to shift and grow. Um, and then of course, as new team members came on, I had more of a role of managing some of those individuals and, and you know, assigning tasks and things like that. Okay, make, makes sense. And I don't know if I, it might be during the same time that you were working there that you were also a volunteer grant writer at Genuine Academy. So tell us, how do you come across that? What did you do in it? Yeah, so I was trying to make sure that I developed some of the skill sets that I may not have had a, an opportunity to, uh, to practice uh, to that point. And yeah, so there was a lot of overlap. So it may have been, you know, a couple hours here on one entity, a couple hours, you know, just making sure that I, I diversified. Um, and so I was searching, I was searching on a lot of volunteer websites uh, for roles around grant writing, because I wanted to, to really practice that skill. And um, I came across that opportunity and it was a local school to, to where I was living at the time. And so I thought, what a great way for me to give back to my local community and also work on some of those grant writing skills. Yeah, definitely a, a perfect match there. And it's, it's important and cool that you're highlighting that, okay, you're doing this work, you you like have this expertise in chronic disease management in diabetes prevention, but you still wanted to gain skills that you were not able to particularly get throughout your, your MPH. And I think grant writing is a skill that translates to everything in public health because everyone everywhere needs a grant writer for something. So, so talking more about that. So how did you build that skill set? Was it, was it just like trial and error or how, how, how did you go about becoming a, a better or more experienced grant writer? So it was definitely trial and error, but, um, you know, researching is something that has always uh, been a part of my, my professional work. And so I really just applied those skills and, in, in, in helping them to find opportunities that they might be eligible for, uh, passing that along to the administrator, um, and seeing what would be a good fit for them, what was realistic for them, given the, the capacity that they had and the time, the constraints that they may have had. Um, and then just um, when the, when they uh, requested me to, to assist with a proposal that I worked with them collaboratively, collaboratively on that. Okay. And it sounds like you built more than just grant writing skills. It sounds like you were doing some grant research as well, which people sometimes confuse and put them together, but they are two completely different things. Um, grant research and grant writing, very important together because you have to research where the grants are that you can apply mm -hmm. and write the grants for. So uh, I, I think you're downplaying that skill set in, in that volunteer position. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. And continuing on in this like this track of like diabetes prevention, you became a diabetes educator slash lifestyle coach at Diabetes You Can Win Foundation Inc. And this was also while you were working at Black Beetle Health. So how did you come across this role and then what did you do in it? Yes. So um, again, a plug for maintaining your networks here. That's going to be the theme of this uh, interview. Um, but um, at, in my role at Four Corners Primary Care Centers, I attended coalition meetings, local county coalition meetings, uh, where individuals across various nonprofits and, and just local um, community-based organizations came together um, to, to collaborate and things like that. And I met the CEO of Diabetes You Can Win Foundation at one of those meetings. Um, and then later on, we, we crossed paths again, decided to stay in touch. I expressed my interest in becoming a CDCES. At the time, it was a CDE, a Certified Diabetes Educator, but the title has now changed to a Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist. But I expressed my interest in that certification at that time, and she was willing to um, give me that exposure and that opportunity to, to just practice those skills. So I came in as a volunteer for the first uh, couple years with her. 
That's awesome. And you also shifted in that same organization to become a program coordinator. So talk, talk to us more about that and what you did as a program coordinator. Yes. So of course, I, I was really focused on getting my hours. If anyone is acquainted with the certification or just any kind of certifications, um, you, you often have to obtain a certain number of hours to sit for the exam. So that's what I was working on. But then as I got more involved in the organization, I saw that I could apply some of my quality improvement skill sets to the organization as well. And as opportunities came for other educators to come on board the team and things like that, I kind of was able to shift my uh, attention. And so um, I, I was able to, to be hired on as a subcontractor uh, with that um, organization on the, on the for-profit side um, to help with liaising with uh, primary care providers, with other community partners, um, as, a, as a preceptor for MPH students who were matriculating through or other dietetic students or undergrads. Um, and so, um, you know, I was able to focus a lot on that, the workflow, the, um, you know, intake, patient intake and, and, and communication and things like that. So you had several overlapping roles during this time. Mm -hmm. How how did you balance that, like work-life balance? Um, yeah, how, how, how did you go about balancing that? Yes, I... I had to be clear on what I have the capacity to do. Um, sometimes I, I definitely struggled because for those of us who really have a heart for the community, you want to do it all and you want to give it all, but you just can't sometimes. And just realizing what I was and was not able to do. And um, in all of this process, without giving all the, the, the timeline, you know, there were times when I had to um, to resolve my time with one entity and then focus more on another and, and recognize that, you know, everything may serve a purpose for a time and a season. And then it's time to move on to the next thing, like you've gained all you can from one um, or I, I my capacity has changed and now it's time for me to move on to something else. And And having the ability, I'll just add, to to transfer skills allowed me to do multiple things without necessarily having to to recreate the wheel so i was already a diabetes educator with diabetes you can win so being able to use and apply those same principles but more like in a uk context helped me with my other role at black Middle health yeah absolutely absolutely important and definitely something that we that I think needs to be spoken more about in public health is like, what does work-life balance look like for you and being someone that wants to save and wants to do all this work and sees all the need? Like, how do you sit back and say like, I also need to save myself and, and do the things that I enjoy, whether that's playing flute or piano or, or whatever else it, it may be, which, which I think is, is important, um, as well as just realizing that many times you can take a role and like you can lean back off of it and then go back into it and just understanding like where you see the value in it at, at that point in time. You made a good point there around knowing when to move on from an organization or like knowing when you've learned enough or learned, yeah, learned enough of whatever you were trying to get, get from. How, how do you think about that when you are working with organizations? Is it that, yeah, how, how do you think more about, more about that? Yes, I think um, it's so important to maintain good relationships so that when the time comes for you to move on, you leave on a good note. You leave where the, the entity is saying, we wish you could stay. You, you never want to leave a space and the entity or the, the administrators are glad for you to go, right? <laughs> so you always want to maintain those relationships and have a good work ethic. Um, and then just just recognizing that, especially in the younger generation, we are always optimizing our skill sets, optimizing our career path and recognizing that being able to proudly say you stayed at the same employer for 20 or 30 years is not the goal in our generation for the most part. We're, we want to capitalize on as much as we can and just continuing to, to reinforce that mindset has helped me to make those tough transitions. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I completely agree with that. that I think that idea of working at the same organization for 30, 20 years is is definitely not something that is the norm now, especially in, in the generation that is the younger generation that is in the workforce. So, uh, yeah, so like I, I feel like when you're going into a position, just really understanding why you're going into it, what are you trying to gain from it, and how is this moving you to that next step of your career um, is, is important to think about even before you even accept that offer letter. So, so I appreciate you sharing that. That's and true. Mm-hmm. yeah, and then continuing more into the theme of diabetes prevention here, you, you became a diabetes educator part time at GNR Public Health. Uh, so, tell us more about that and why did you decide to pursue that and what did you do in it? So, again, it was about my network. So, um, the, the CEO of Diabetes You Can Win and, and Renew and Live, um, she referred me. Um, there was a position of vacancy that came up at GNR and she referred me to, for the position and I applied and interviewed and all of that and uh, was was given that position, was accepted for that position. And so, um, again, I had the opportunity to transfer a lot of those skills that I had already developed. And again, as I was working towards um, all of my patient caring hours, I was able to do that at, at a more rapid pace, um, having that that full time well, that part-time position with GNR. Um, and so I, uh, once I, I really said, you know, it's time for me to dive into public health more, more definitively, more completely, and, and more in a focused way, um, I, I worked um, just part-time, just a few hours a week um, with both, um, both positions and then made the, the, the decision to transition from Four Corners into GNR as my primary role. Okay, make makes sense, makes sense. And I believe you also moved from a diabetes educator into a chronic disease educator, program coordinator, still part-time. And then from there, you moved into a chronic disease program manager. I'm guessing that this was full-time or mm-hmm. more than part-time. So tell us about the, that that career path in, in, this, in this work at GNR Public Health. Yeah. So again, as I kind of mentioned before, I was very much focused on diabetes for for several years, but then recognizing that we don't treat people in silos. Oftentimes, if a person is 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 at risk for or living with diabetes, they are most likely also dealing with or at risk for other chronic conditions. You're going to be talking about their blood pressure. You're going to be talking about their cholesterol. They probably also may be at risk for some other conditions. Um, and, and so learning that we don't treat people in silos um, allowed me to say, how can I expand and apply those same uh, principles across the board? And the issue of funding was also um, a factor there. Um, I was working, GNR is, is a local health district um, in the metro Atlanta area. So it was very much dependent upon funding that came either through the state or the federal um, government. And so the opportunities for staffing were also dependent on the funding opportunities that were there. So I really wanted to invest my time into demonstrating our impact because the more that you demonstrate impact, the impact of the program is the more likely you are to get that renewed funding. So. Yeah, well, I appreciate you sharing that. That That's very informative. And you currently work as a program manager at Unstuck. So how did you come across this and what do you do in this role? So Unstuck uh, started uh, about a year ago and it was actually through my former work at Black Needle Health. I was invited uh, a few months ago to be a consultant uh, with Unstuck. And so again, just maintaining those relationships, maintaining those networks, I was able to to use a lot of the experience that I had gained working um, in the UK um, target populations into the work with Unstuck Consultancy. Okay, um, um, what type of work do you do as a program manager? Yeah, so is it mostly you know on the in the background, just kind of maintaining uh, relationships with partners, um, liaising with team members on various projects, um, managing budgets, um, and then of course just executing and delivering um, various um, consulting opportunities that have been that have been given based on 
you know, the, the, the interested parties, third parties. And what do you like most about working at Unstuck? I love the opportunity to continue building my skill set, um, the, the flexibility, um, but also the, the idea that we are able to apply the same skills across any kind of uh, uh, a subject, an area of, of study or an area of interest. So just, again, continuing to apply those same skills and recognizing that um, having worked within healthcare in the pharmacy realm, having worked within primary care, um, and then working with the local public health um, sector, I've recognized that there are advantages working within the system, and then there are also things that would best be addressed or that may benefit from capacity added through consultants who are experts in a particular subject. Um, and so I, it's really just expanded my thinking about the, the opportunities and the, the, um, the, the, the value that I can bring to those same spaces that I've encountered in the past saying, okay, maybe you don't have the capacity to have a full-time employee. Maybe you don't have the, the, maybe the project that you need does not require a full-time employee, but maybe I can come in for this project. Maybe I can support in this way um, for this particular time frame and deliver this particular um, product to you and then move on to another opportunity. What has the best onboarding process for you working as a consultant look like? Or like, what, what do you think is the best way for you to get onboarded into a company to do work and deliver what they want? I think it's looking at the gaps, being able to identify the gaps and to be able to submit a proposal to say, here's how I could be of assistance and here's how you can uh, benefit. There are toolkits online, especially, of course, my my lane, <laughs> my area of ex expertise is diabetes. So whether it's diabetes prevention or management, there are toolkits that have been developed online to show providers the cost benefit for implementing these educational systems in their practices. So in whatever area you might be in, you might be able to find similar toolkits or guides to say, Let's crunch some numbers. Let's look at the, the benefit to your patient outcomes if I come on board and deliver this service for you or provide this quality um, education or, or coordination. So being able to find gaps is, is you know, most important for the onboarding process and being able to, to, to show how you can add value there. I love that. I love that. And I think that that's very public health, you know, like looking for the gaps, looking for the needs and then sharing like, this is the value that I can do. These are the things that I can do within those gaps to really support your organization, as well as like, as you said earlier, thinking about many organizations don't have the capacity to do the work. So how can, how can you assist them as a consultant in really hitting those deliverables and being successful in the program or the, the outcomes that they are looking for, which is really, really cool and important. And as you shared throughout your journey, you've had many, many different public health roles and responsibilities. What challenges have you encountered while working on chronic disease prevention initi initiatives and how have you over overcome those? Good question. One of the biggest challenges that I've had is helping to expand the perception of who is qualified to deliver a particular type of information. Um, I know that in in your interactions, your podcasts, and 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 other associations, I'm sure that it's been a common theme that people don't understand what public health is and and what value public health practitioners have sometimes in certain in certain realms. So being adjacent to the, the clinical space, one challenge has been um, being able to uh, demonstrate that I'm able to function in, in a particular space to, to support the clinical team, um, even though I may not have a, a nursing or a, an MD degree or something like that. So that's been one of the challenges is showing that, hey, um, your, your clients need not only the care for their physical or medical conditions, 
but they also need resources as far as supporting them socially, as far as supporting them financially and supporting them in, in other areas of their life for that whole health um, besides just the clinical. So how can I come alongside to make sure that the patient's outcomes are optimized if some of these other resources are in place. So being able to show that, that these things can be integrated um, can be a challenge at times. Yeah, but but again, back. to your to the second part of your question is how did I overcome it? I overcame it by by establishing common ground. So being able to say, I've worked in primary care for many years. I've worked in pharmacy. I understand the demands. I understand the quotas, the time restraints, the, the budgetary restraints. How can I make this as easy for your workflow as possible while also making sure that the patients are actually getting the, the services that they need? I love that, like level setting and just being open and honest, because th that probably is a lot of the questions that they have. And this person has this expertise, but do they know how our field works and this and that? And like, just from the beginning, putting it out there, like, hey, I've worked in various settings. I know like the demands and the things that, that are like holding you all accountable. And I understand that. And I'm going to work within my context to, to be effective in doing that work. So uh, I appreciate you sharing that great, great advice. And so two questions before I move you on to the Furious Five. The first one being, where would you like to see yourself in the future? I hope and plan to have more of an advocacy role because I've, I've worked more on the, the local level of, of health education for some time now. And I recognize more and more in, in the public health world that uh, that just individual behavior change is not always the, the, the root or the, the sole issue. Looking at the, the systems that people are dealing with is, is much more impactful for, for long-term change in the community than just the individual level. So I really want to take more of an advocacy role in the near future. Love that. Love that. We have to focus on the systems, policies, and structures to, to make that long lasting change. So, so I appreciate, appreciate you sharing that. And I look forward to seeing how your journey unfolds so that you're able to do more of that in, in your role and in your work going forward. Definitely. Yeah. And then other question before we move into Furious 5 was where can people connect with you? So right now um, I am building my Instagram platform. So people are welcome to follow me at Health and Wellscape. Um, I, uh, you know, periodically share tips and things. I, I discuss, um, you know, what's happening in, in the, the popular uh, media as far as health related topics um, and just share things that I'm working on. So um, you can follow me there. Okay, and I'll definitely um, link that in, in the show notes for anyone that's interested. So thank you for sharing that. And then if anyone wants to email me for direct consulting, um, they're welcome to also email me at health and wellscape. And that's with an N, health and wellscape at gmail.com. Okay, and I'll also add that as well. So, so thank you for sharing that. Okay, so moving you on to the Furious Five, five questions that, that I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? I would say take advantage of opportunities for shadowing and don't feel like you have to limit yourself to any one area, but recognizing that the field of public health is very broad and there are many different ways uh, to practice public health, even in non-traditional ways. Number two, if you are talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Use your warm networks, uh, recognizing that in your graduating classes, in your graduate studies, you have other individuals who work in different fields, whether that's business, um, sociology, um, finance, and things like that, who can benefit from your skill set, uh, the, the medical field, and putting all those things together. So use your warm networks. Number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Right now, I am working on building my, uh, my LLC and uh, building my consulting platforms to make it something more consistent and uh, just defining my reach. Awesome, I look forward to that as well. Yeah. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? So I recommend um, 
if you may have pursued a particular track of public health, but you're saying, hey, I'm still interested in or need a refresher on certain courses or certain subject matters, definitely look at free trainings that are available online. Um, every once in a while, I might do a training through train.org or um, the, one of the public health networks. Like, for example, I live in the Southeast, so I look for the region for uh, public health trainings that are available. If you just want to brush up on a particular topic or listen to panel discussions, um, even Coursera is a great place where if you want to just brush up on a topic, um, you can do that. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. And then number five, which is a new question that's been added to the Furious Five, and I hope that you were able to look at it before. But um, number five, if there was one piece of advice you'd give your younger self, what would that advice be? The advice I would give to my younger self is take advantage of the time that you have. Um, of course, a, a message, a common theme that we continue, continue to reiterate is you're never too old to, to pivot. However, take advantage of the opportunities that you have when you're younger uh, to, to really invest the time to, to complete the degrees, the fields of study, because as we get older, sometimes the priorities may expand to include family and other obligations and things get a little bit more, more tricky to balance um, with older, older, in, in older parts of life. Yeah, very, very important and insightful information. So thank you for sharing that, Sarah. And thank you for coming on and sharing your, your expertise and your journey. I def definitely appreciate it oh, very much. It's been a pleasure being here and I, I'm so happy to, to be a part. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to share that, uh, share what I've experienced and what I've learned with your audience. Truly, truly is my pleasure and look forward to staying connected and, and looking to see where your career takes you next. So looking forward to that very, very much. So housekeeping items, everyone. Thank you all so much for listening or watching this. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button if you're watching it on YouTube and share a review with us and share it with a friend. That way it gets out to more people and other people can get help and just understand how they can navigate their public health careers. So be sure to subscribe, like, review, and share with a friend. Appreciate you all. See you all next week.